I'd just like to take a second and introduce our speaker this morning. His name is uh, Cody Guitar, and he is uh, he works with an organization called Ratio Christi, and he also is recently hired on as staff at Crandall University. He's been coming to our church now for what five years? Five years. He was one of our Crandall interns way back when, and uh, just really excited to hear him come and share God's word with us this morning. Hello. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Good morning. So, this is my first time getting to preach in here, so this is exciting. So I recognize a lot of you, don't know a lot of you, so that's intimidating. So uh, for those of you who uh, looked at your bulletins, you, I'm sure you uh, caught the title of my sermon. Discerning truth in a world of fake news and false views. And uh, I'm sure that uh, when you saw the title of my sermon this morning, certain associations came to mind when you saw the term fake news. The term uh, bears certain connotations these days. And for some, fake news may be trigger words, bringing to mind certain events or maybe People, I don't know. But in all seriousness, the fact of the matter is that we do live in a world that is full of fake news and false views. And to one extent or another, this has always been the case throughout history. Whether it's been in the form of conflicting accounts of historical events, unfulfilled predictions about the future, or false notions of what is fact, And what is fiction? And in a world of fake news and false views, it becomes more and more difficult to discern what is true and what is not. And especially in uh, our modern age of astounding technological advances that allow virtually any information to be accessed and spread like wildfire, it becomes not only impossible to take it all in, but it gets more and more difficult to discern which information is true and which is not. And we as Christians, in particular, have had our own share of fake news and false views make its way into our churches, infiltrating our congregations, oftentimes, ever so subtly, in the form of false teachings, contrary to biblical Christianity. And this should be deeply concerning for us as Christians because Christianity by nature has a deep concern for truth, right? The Christian worldview itself claims to be true. The gospel message, the good news that Jesus came as the God-man to suffer and die for our sins and to rise from the dead, conquering death, that claims to be true. Jesus Christ himself claims to be the truth. The Holy Spirit claims to be the spirit of truth. And God's word claims to be truth. And we're told time and time again in God's word that Christians are to believe the truth. We're to be grounded in the truth. We're to speak the truth, teach the truth, rejoice in the truth, love in truth, live according to the truth, and worship in truth. We are, in fact, as Christians, saved by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, despite Scripture's focus on the centrality of truth, Christians today have often become all too quick to accept anyone and anything which bears the Christian label. We even have a name for it these days, nominal Christianity. And uh, this takes many forms, whether it be in uh, some new teaching circulating in the churches, or the newest book to hit the Christian bookstore, or something a celebrity said that sounds spiritual, or even just it sounds Christian, or even the latest song to show up on the Christian radio station. And I'm afraid, and I'm not the only one, but... I'm afraid that many, 
if not most Christians, and I've been guilty of this myself, most Christians today do not take the time to thoughtfully and critically examine what they hear before accepting it. Yet we are told time and time again in Scripture that not everyone and everything that claims to be of God or even has the appearance of being of God is in fact of God. Satan himself is said to be able to disguise himself as an angel of light. Irenaeus, uh, one of the uh, great writers of the early church, he rightly noted that falsity is not always easy to identify. And uh, he said, and I quote here, error never shows itself in its naked reality in order not to be discovered. On the contrary, it dresses elegantly so that the unwary may be led to believe that it is more truthful than truth itself. We're even warned in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 4, that there will be many who will not want to listen to the truth. That, and again, I quote here, Apostle Paul says that there is a time that is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And scripture is full of warnings such as these. It's full of warnings about false messiahs, false Christs, false saviors. Full of warnings about false prophets, false teachers, false apostles, false disciples, false doctrine or teaching, and even false gospels, false proclamations of good news. The Bible, quite bluntly, mind you, calls those who do not practice discernment about these things simple, naive, gullible, and childish. These are the Bible's words, not mine. See, Scripture commands us to test everything. And Jesus, in his ministry, commanded that we must not judge. Again, I'm quoting here from Jesus. These are his words, not mine. He says that we are not to judge by appearances, but we are to judge with right judgment. Now, this, of course, begs the question, what does right judgment look like? How are we to judge rightly? In a world of fake news and false views, of false teachings, how are we to distinguish between truth and falsity? How do we discern what is fact and what is fiction? What is true and what is false? Well, Scripture tells us that the final authority for discerning all matters of truth and falsity is God's revealed truth. Now, before I flush this out, I want to take a little size up here and make a little clarification because I know some people probably are thinking of this right now. I am not saying that there is no truth outside of Scripture. That is not at all what I'm saying. For those of you who know me, you know I'm a Christian apologist. I deal with uh, a ministry that involves uh, defending the Christian faith. We draw oftentimes from materials outside of Scripture. Uh, and we would say, in fact, that there is much truth, knowledge, and even wisdom outside of Scripture. The Bible itself says this. The author of Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8, tells us to observe the ant, to gain wisdom about productivity. I don't know about you, but I don't have any ants in my Bible. Paul tells us in Romans 1, verses 18 to 20, that we can learn certain truths about our Creator through the study of His creation. The Apostle again tells us in Philippians 3, verse 17, that we can learn how to live rightly from the example of others, like your pastors. And in Paul's sermon in Athens, recorded for us in Acts 17, verses 22 to 34, we find the Apostle himself drawing from the thought of Greek, non-Christian, pagan philosophers to make an intellectual case for the truth of Christianity. But the key point that I want us to remember here uh, when receiving information from outside of divinely revealed truth, such as what we have here in our Bibles and divinely inspired scripture is this. Extra biblical truth will not contradict biblical truth. This is because truth by nature is consistent. So whatever truth we find in God's world, if it is truth indeed, will not contradict God's word. And this, of course, brings us to our key text for today. 
So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me. Whoa, this just lowered on its own. That's freaky. All right. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. That's not John chapter 1. It's 1 John chapter 4. I preached a sermon in another church, and half the congregation had turned to John's gospel. So, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Version, the standard uh, Bible for all Christians, obviously. So, it opens up with a warning. John writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, I want to set the context here. Earlier on in John's epistle, he talks about these these spirits. And they're demonic spirits. And he identifies them as being at the root of falsehood, contrary to divinely revealed truth, Christian truth. And the fact that he links these spirits here with false prophets with people, false teachers, is most telling about the source of these falsities. So he gives us the warning. So how then do we identify these false prophets? How do we identify these spirits of, of lie, these lying spirits? Well, he gives us two tests. The first he starts to explain in verse 2. He says, This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming Even now, it is already in the world. So what's the first test? Well, the first test to determine if something is true or false is, is it consistent with the divinely revealed truth in the person of Jesus Christ? The God-man. And where do we learn about Jesus Christ? In Scripture. Right? Right? So is the truth claim consistent with the person of Jesus Christ as he is revealed to us in Scripture? What about the second text? He says, starting at verse 4, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world. And the world listens to them. Here's the test right here. We are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. Who is the us, the we, who John is referring to here? Well, the broader context of his epistle and of the New Testament itself, the us or the we here is referring to the apostles. right? The witnesses to the resurrected Christ. The ones to whom Christ, even before his ascension gave special authority to complete God's written revelation to mankind, which is in the New Testaments you have in your Bibles. He promised them that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And so that's what John's saying here. We are from God. If somebody is going to make a claim to truth, then in order for that claim to be true, to be possibly true, it has to be consistent with what we've already revealed to you. And then he closes it off quite plainly. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception, or as many of your translations would say, the spirit of error. This is how we distinguish between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we have two tests. Truth will be consistent with God's specially revealed truth, in the person of Jesus Christ, who is made known to us in Scripture, and truth will be consistent with God's specially revealed truth in Scripture more broadly. Now, I know you're probably thinking, if those of you who are paying attention, are probably thinking, 
Uh, well, no, well, John only referred to the apostles there. Well, the apostles and their associates are the ones who wrote the New Testament, and the New Testament affirms the Old Testament. So, yeah, it's all of Scripture. That is the test, the standard which God has left us. You ever heard the phrase canon of Scripture? The canon of Scripture? Has anyone heard that phrase before? Does anyone know what the word canon means? Anybody? It means rule or standard. Right? Scripture is the rule or standard by which we know truth. That's the idea that, com- that comes with that from the earliest times of the, of the church. This is how we are to test everything. To discern what is true and what is false. We are to test everyone and everything against the divinely revealed truth found in the person of Jesus Christ and in God's inerrant, infallible, indestructible, imperishable, inspired, authoritative word. The Bible is the canon, rule, or standard of discerning truth from falsity. And rather than allowing ourselves to become conformed to the pattern of the world by uncritically accepting anything and everything it offers to us, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds and show wise discernment with our feet firmly rooted in God's revealed standard for truth. We must be like the Bereans in Acts 17, searching the scriptures every day to see if what we have been told is true. I want to leave you with a thought from the Apostle Paul. He gives us in uh, his letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. He says, all scripture, all of it, all scripture is breathed out by God, And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters, we need to study Scripture. We need to know and understand the standard of truth which God has given to us. This is how we will combat falsity. This is how we will discern truth in a world of fake news and false views. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have to be able to come so openly, so joyfully in your name, gathered together in fellowship, to hear your word this morning, to worship together, to learn about you, and to learn about the truth which you have revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and in your inspired word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us such wonderful guidance for our lives here today. And we pray that those who uh, heard this message this morning would be edified and challenged, and including myself, that we uh, take time to diligently study the word, to know the standard of truth which you have left for us, so that we may be able to better discern between what is true and what is false here in the world. I pray for your blessing on everyone here today. All in Christ's name, amen.